Good morning. My name is Kevin Ballard. I'm one of the ministers at the Pikes Peak Church of Christ in Colorado Springs. And I'm recording this video because yesterday during our live stream we seemed to have some technical complications with our YouTube feed. Several of you said that the feed cut out at the very beginning or at during sometime during the lesson. Also some of you said it cut out only to be replaced by some other program. Uh, they went back to our program and it did the same thing. So don't know what those technical difficulties are. Uh, some people couldn't even log on and get it started to begin with. So what we wanted to do was simply uh, put this in recorded format, post it on YouTube, and then you could watch it at your convenience. And we hope you enjoy the time spent together in our study, uh, which would have been yesterday, but it's today. And hope you, hope you enjoy that very, very, very much. Last week we began a series of lessons on the book of 1 John. And we stated that the overall, the overall theme of the book of 1 John was that your joy may be full. That was John's statement, his purpose, John chapter 1 and verse 4. And we said that the book was divided in an interesting way. In the very first chapter, John addresses his audience using the word we. Now, who is included in that we, we don't know, but we, it stands to reason that it would be John the Apostle, those brothers and sisters in Christ who were with him, perhaps other church leaders and elders. Uh, perhaps he's invoking the weight of the entire apostolic authority of all those who carried the name Apostle in the first century. And I think he does that to throw his weight as an Apostle and the weight of the other Apostles and the weight of the entire church behind the importance of this particular message. There seem to be grave problems that were facing the church with false teachers and false doctrines and he wanted to start at the very beginning by saying we bring you our apostolic authority to tell you what is right and in a minute we'll talk about how he starts that in the first couple of verses but he throws his weight behind that to make sure that they understood the importance of what he had to say and then in chapter 2 he switches to the use of the word I and once that groundwork had been established of the apostolic authority leading all the way back to God, speaking on behalf of God, he uses a different style of dialogue. It's a more personal touch. He calls himself the elder, and he's writing, as he says, to his little children. With the weight of the apostolic authority behind him, he then switches gears to say, I'm not writing this just out of my authority, but I'm writing this because I love you, I'm concerned about you, I care about you, and I want to share with you some very important things you need to know so that you can continue to, as the book will say, walk in the light as he, speaking of God, is in the light. And last week, we noticed the first four verses. That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was in the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So kind of to summarize what he said, we notice, and this is my own wording, John said, we heard, we saw, and touched Jesus. We declare him to you. Why? So that you may have fellowship with him, and in doing so, that your joy may be full. John said he was writing earlier from that apostolic authority, and then he switches to this idea of his beloved children. But with verses 1 and 2, he adds to that the witness of, we have heard, we have seen, we have touched Jesus. This is not secondhand information. This is not some dream in the middle of the night. This is a direct statement. These are things which the Lord has said himself. And so he added that bit of information to his statement about we writing to you so that they would know that this is coming from Jesus, not from John. John is the mouthpiece. John is the messenger. He is the one who is bringing these words to them, words that come from the Lord, come from the Lord himself. And today we're going to pick up there in verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him 
and declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Remember in the introduction we talked a little bit about the preliminary group of what would become the Gnostics and the Docetics. They were had their beginnings, especially the Gnostics in the first century, went on to be more prevalent perhaps in the second century. But they claimed to have a special knowledge. They claimed to know things that an average Christian didn't know. And as a result, they could, well, pretty much say anything they wanted to since they had special knowledge and the average church member couldn't dispute that because if they did have this special knowledge, then that perhaps gave them more insight into God's will. And I think John is writing to tell them that's not the way it works. We don't have special knowledge. We don't have anything except what comes from the Word of God. And he is preaching the Word of God. He is teaching the Word of God. And again, there in verse 5, this is the message which we heard from him. From whom? From Jesus, the one we saw, the one we heard, the one we touched, the one we handled, the one we spent three years with while he was here while he was here on this earth. And this is what John wanted to point out. God is light, and in him there is no, no darkness at all. God is light. Now, it's common to look at light and darkness as, what shall we say, metaphors, uh, word pictures, ideas about how to describe something. Light and dark are part of the religious culture, perhaps no matter what the religion is. Light's mentioned 272 times in Scripture and darkness 205 times in Scripture. Intellectually, light is truth. Darkness is error or ignorance. In morality, light is purity, and darkness is evil. And so, God is light. And we realize that's a metaphor, it's a symbolic statement. John is not trying to make a definitive statement about the nature of God. Consider Genesis 1 and verse 3, God created light. And so, we're using that as a word picture and not saying that we are understanding God as that particular picture. God is spirit, according to John chapter 4 and verse 24. And in 1 John 3 and verse 2, John will say, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. In this plane of physical existence, we can't understand God, so we use things we can understand to describe him. Therefore, God is light. And so John seems to be trying to tell us something about the character of God, the ideal of his will. God is light. Everything that's lovely, beautiful, holy, good, desirable, righteous, lovable, that's God. Jesus says, or John speaking of Jesus says, in him was life, and the light was the light of men. God is light. Jesus is a light to man. John 14 and verse 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father, said Jesus. And so John is emphatically stating God is light. That light was revealed by Jesus, and I, John, am telling you what that light said. And to carry that analogy just a little further outside of the book of 1 John, you are the light of the world. All Christians are told. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. We're told we don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket, but we set it on a stand so that it gives light to everyone. God is light. Jesus revealed that light. We reflect that light into this world as part of our fulfilling of the Great Commission. And as we look back at our passage, it says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin walking in the light. That's the message this morning. We need to be walking in the light. What does that do for us? What does walking in the light bring? 
Well, it brings, number one, fellowship. John is very clear that we can't have fellowship with God as long as we walk in darkness. He points out that God has no darkness, and that if we claim fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, well, we're lying. We don't have the truth. And the question that may arise in some people's mind is this, if that's the case, then fellowship with God is impossible. And the reason they think that perhaps is, we say, if God has no darkness and I have sin in my life, which is attested to us by Romans 3 and verse 23, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. That sin is darkness, and that darkness keeps us from having fellowship with God. Since there will always be sin, because we live in a fallen and sinful world, there can never be fellowship with God. That's their line of reasoning. That's their concern. That's their worry. And to that line of reasoning, John would respond in verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> also in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. John understood there would be sin. He knew we didn't become perfect after we put on the Lord in baptism. He knew we couldn't live perfect. Only one perfect person ever walked the face of this earth, and that was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He would had no deceit in his mouth, no sin ever committed, and that's the standard we try to live up to, knowing that there is no way that we can do that here in this world. At the beginning of chapter 2, he writes, I write to you that you may not sin, but if anyone sins... And then he goes on to talk more about that, which we'll discuss, Lord willing, next week. If anyone sins, we know that it's going to happen. We know that it can happen. John didn't get to be an elder, preacher, without understanding that sin was part of this world. So when John's talking about walking in the light, he's not talking about sinlessness. It would be impossible. It's an unobtainable goal while we are in this earthen vessel, as Paul would say in another place of our physical bodies. So walking in the light brings fellowship. Isaiah 59 and verse 2 tells us that our sins have made a separation between us and God, and he has hid his face from us. God cannot abide sin. Therefore, there must be some way for us to have fellowship with him that takes care of that sin. So walking in the light brings fellowship. How does it do that? It does it by cleansing. How is that cleansing accomplished? Well, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And a couple of verses earlier in verse 7, it says that cleansing is possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember under the Old Testament, Israel would bring animal sacrifices and they would offer that blood for their sins and for various other things uh, in, the, in the Old Testament law. Once a year, the high priest would take that blood, go to the Holy of Holies and make an atonement. For all of Israel as a result of that. Without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption, Scripture says. The Scripture also says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It was Jesus' perfect, sinless, freely given blood that made all this cleansing possible. The animals of the Old Testament did not freely give up their life. It was taken from them. Jesus freely laid down his life, his perfect life. He stood in substitute for me. I'm the one who sinned, therefore I'm the one who should be punished. Jesus took that punishment for me so that I didn't have to experience it. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does it mean to confess? Well, the word confess in the Greek is the word homo legeo. Homo means the same, and legeo means to speak. So confession means to speak the same thing. Well, the same thing as who? The same thing as what? And the obvious answer to that question is God. We speak the same thing God would say. When we confess our sins, we ought to say of them, our sins, the same thing God would say of them. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. That should be the context of our confession, that that sin in my life is darkness. We justify it by saying, well, if you only knew the circumstances, or there were mitigating factors, or it really wasn't a sin, it was just a little, what do we call them, a little white lie. 
We try to justify ourselves. But if we're going to confess so that we can have fellowship with God, we've got to say the same thing about our sins that God would say about our sins. Fellowship and cleansing are the benefits of walking in the light. But what that means is there's a constant evaluation in my life to make sure that I'm really walking in the light and not just deceiving myself. You know, we evaluate ourselves constantly in every other aspect of our life, probably at your work. There's some sort of evaluation done for your performance. The boss may call you in and go through the things that he or she thinks you're doing great, doing well, some things you could use some improvement in, just a kind of an idea of, a, of an evaluation to say, okay, we could always do better. Here are some ways that maybe you can do better. We evaluate our parenting skills. As our children grow, our parenting styles may change because of the differing nature of their age and their level of understanding. And so we constantly evaluate if we're being the kind of godly parents that he wants us to be. We evaluate our marriage. Am I being a good husband? Am I being a good wife? Am I being attentive and, and caring and doing the things I'm supposed to do? So we evaluate all sorts of things in our life. But how often do we really evaluate our religious life, our life within the church, our life within the body of Christ? Walking in the light is not just a stroll through the park. It's a constant reminder that we live in a minefield. And those minds are located out there in the darkness. I can't see them. I can't know when I'm going to step on one, but as long as I'm in the light, I can see where I'm going, and I have direction. Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And the word cleansing here is very interesting. Katharidzai. It denotes a continuous action. Now, some people take that to say that, well, it's a continuous action. I'm in Christ, and therefore his blood cleanses me of all my sins. But there's a, there's a statement made about that that doesn't make that quite entirely true. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then his blood cleanses us continually from all sin. It's not automatic. It's incumbent upon me to walk in the light so that I have the fellowship with God, so that I have the cleansing with God. If we don't walk in the light and we don't confess our sins, that cleansing can't take place. It is the blood of Jesus that keeps us essentially sinless. Now, notice I didn't say it doesn't keep us from sinning, but it does keep us from sin in that it washes away the sins when we confess those sins, when we say the same thing about those sins to God that he would say about them. Paul talked more about that in Romans 3, beginning in verse 23. And again, we've already mentioned this first scripture. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation. That's a big Bible word, isn't it? An atonement, a sin bearer, uh, in some ways a substitute. Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. Again, that faith is synonymous with walking in the light. So Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin. So what have we said? God is light. To have fellowship, we must walk in the light and confess our sins. And that fellowship includes the cleansing of our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. One other thing that goes with this talk is the idea of the truth. John 8 and verse 32, you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Remember what John said in the text we read? If we claim fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness, we do not have the truth. If we claim we have no sin, the truth is not in us. The truth makes us free. The truth is what makes possible the fellowship and the cleansing. So walking in the light and walking in the truth are essentially the same thing. You can't have one without the other. And the truth we know comes from God's Word. John said, I write these things to you so you may not sin. It's that written Word. 
that Bible that maybe you're holding in your lap or you've got pulled up on your tablet or your cell phone or however you're reading it this morning. Those are the words of God. God is light. Jesus shed that light. And we reflect that light as we continue his work under the Great Commission. And so, as we think about our own selves, am I walking in the light? Am I walking in the light as he is in the light? Do I have the fellowship with God? Do I have the cleansing with God? And I hope and pray that all of us can say yes, but if not, hope and pray we'll have the honesty and integrity to do something about that. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to spend time in your word. We thank you that you made it so clear and so eloquent at the same time. And Father, we understand that you expect much from us, but then you also give much to us when we fail and when we fall short. Help us to be willing to confess our sins. Help us to be willing to be honest about our lives, to evaluate and figure out how to do better. Bless all those who are at home in some form of quarantine. Father, bless them with health. Bless them with safety. Keep them ever in your loving care until such time as we can all be free of this and meet together again and share our joys of life one-on-one -on -one personally. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for being here this morning. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please let us know, especially technical issues that you're having with your YouTube feed. Uh, contact us at the office. Our office number is 719-634-6138, or you can reach us through our website at ppcc at pikespeakchurchofchrist.org. That's the office email. Uh, questions, comments, uh, maybe you're watching this video and you have no association with the Churches of Christ and would like to know more, contact us. We'd love to have the opportunity to tell you who we are, what we believe, what we see in God's Word, and we would love to share that with you if you had, would have that interest. So until next time, Grady will be teaching a lesson on Wednesday evening at 6.30. Hope you'll join in and have a safe and blessed week.